So often these days, the media focuses on negative stereotypes about young black men rather than giving a much more nuanced portrait. So it always gives me great pleasure to address that issue head on. I've known Cortland Wycliffe since he was just 10 years old. At 15, he entered Rice University, becoming the youngest African-American to earn a degree in bioengineering, but he didn't stop there. He's now barely 22 and about to earn his law degree in a matter of weeks from Harvard. Still not done this fall. Don't ask me why. He's going back to school at Texas A&M to get a Ph.D. in engineering. I am honored to welcome my friend, my young friend, Cortland Wickham, to this program. Cortland, first of all, congratulations. Thank you, and thank you for having me. No, I'm glad to have you on, man. This has been, it's been quite a journey for me uh, to have met you when you were 10 and mm -hmm. to have followed you all these years. And, and um, I, I, I can't get to Cambridge on May 30th for your graduation, so I figured I'd get you to come out here yeah. so I can tell you congratulations <laughs> here before everybody else gets to tell you congratulations. It's clear with, you know, a degree from Rice, Harvard Law, going back this fall for a Ph.D. in engineering, it's clear that the education bug bit you long ago. How'd that happen for you? Well, for me, it's always been about goals. Mm -hmm. So one of the goals that I set pretty early on for myself is that I wanted to uh, own and start a biomedical device company. And so when I was figuring out what that path looked like, my mom sat down with me and she said, well, other people who have done it have had these credentials. And to me, that wasn't enough. So I said, okay, well, you know, a PhD, that's good, but I love the law. Uh, I often got criticized for practicing law without a license, so I said to myself, <laughs> well, you know, since you told me to stop doing it without a license, let me go get this license I keep hearing about. And so I set out that plan when I was actually about 10. And as you know, I've been saying I was going to do it for so long, and I just, I, I'm glad to be able to follow through. Yeah. Um, why engineering? Engin well... Those were the people who got to do the most exciting things to me. Mm -hmm. So uh, my mom is, of course, a mechanical engineer, and uh, she always got to tinker with things, take things apart, and that's what I wanted to do. I uh, got in trouble quite a few times for uh, taking things apart, and at the time I didn't have the skills to put them back together. <laughs> but, you know, I, I picked it up. So uh, last year I took apart our TV, put it back together, and it was fixed, and she was happy that I had broken a few <laughs> things before. So... That that was the big thing to me. They got to do the exciting work, and that's the stuff I wanted to do. Yeah. Um, you, you know full well because you mentor a lot of young people. I want to come back to the mentoring work that I've tried to you, and you, you're paying it forward by mentoring mm -hmm. other young people. So I want to come back to the mentoring in a second here. Um, you know full well that in this country across the board, not just for black mm -hmm. students or students of color, but across the board, America has a problem with STEM. We're not teaching. We're not, yes. not, it's not that we're not teaching it. We don't have students excelling. Mm -hmm. as they should in science and technology and engineering and math. So these STEM programs mm -hmm. are being supported by major companies all across the country trying to get more kids into that pipeline. What say you to young people about why they ought to consider that pipeline and why are we having these troubles getting young people interested? Well, I think it actually is a responsibility of people in my age demographic, so the young engineers. We have to make it accessible because it's, it's really hard for somebody to go to somebody who's a manager who's been in the industry for 40 years and understand that pathway to get to being an engineer. Mm -hmm. And then also, you know, we have to demystify it a little bit. Um, a lot of things that engineers do... People do all the time. It's just that they don't realize that they're doing engineering. Mm -hmm. So when um, I was younger, we would have things that would break around the house. Our table would be wobbly. We would identify the problem. We would come up with a simple solution, and we would implement it. That's what engineering is. Mm -hmm. But if you focus on, you know, the the high-level questions rather than focusing on what engineering is at its core, you, you sometimes get a disconnect from younger students. And so I find that the best way to do it is just demystify it, show them what the engineering process is, and then get them to apply it to everyday life and get comfortable with it. We know that famously Dr. King, who you and I have had many conversations about, you know mm -hmm. my regard for Dr. King is the greatest American, I believe, mm -hmm. this country has ever produced. King famously goes to Morehouse at 15. Mm -hmm. You went to Rice at 15. Um, give me some sense of what it's like to be on a college campus sitting in classes, engineering classes, when you're a black male, 15-year-old. Well, 
it's I, I was always raised that you, know, you you you're just designed to stand out, mm -hmm. and so that was never a problem for, for me. I was excited to you know get to meet all these new people, mm -hmm. uh, get to get exposed to so many different things, and so the the biggest thing for me was I had to remind people of my age because I would regularly get put in situations. Um, for instance, got a job one time, and because of my resume was so extensive, they didn't realize how young I was, mm -hmm. and so. They actually, they weren't supposed to hire somebody under 17. They, they hadn't seen a 17-year-old who had already been in college for two, three years. Mm -hmm. So they were a bit surprised by that. <laughs> and so, you know, that's actually the only challenge that I, I really faced. But it was, it's largely because I had a lot of grounding and I was exposed to higher education at a young age. So it just felt, it felt normal to me. I felt comfortable. Yeah. So you do Rice. Um, after Rice, there are a lot of law schools that you could go to. I see what you're trying to do. You want to own this company, so you want to have a legal background. You want to have an engineering background, so you know how to run the company in all facets mm -hmm. and asset, uh, in all facets of the company. I get that part. Um, but of all the law schools you could have gone to, why Harvard, and how did that happen? Because Harvard is, is Harvard. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, well, the reason why is because, of course, Harvard is Harvard, and right. so when I was younger asking, well, what's the best law school I could go to so I can really be the best at running this company, my mom told me Harvard, and so I said, okay, well, that's the law school I need to go to. Let me, let me jump in right quick um, before you finish telling the story. Is that a question that you routinely ask yourself? That's a very important question you just raised, and I wonder um, the extent to which you have been successful because you always start by asking the right question, which is what is the best out there? Yes, I, I think that that's really important. And it's not just so I don't want to say the best being, you know, the number one ranked or the mm -hmm. best being uh, some abstract idea mm -hmm. of best, but really the best for you. I mm -hmm. think a lot of times people don't ask that question. So for me, uh, going back to Rice undergrad, Rice undergrad was the best for me. It was in Houston. I got to be near family and it was a, a close, tight knit ca campus. So mm -hmm. I got a lot of interaction with my professors. And so it was the best school for me. And I think that that was the question I also asked when I was going to Harvard. Is this the best school for me as well as the best so that I can uh, get to my goals? And how was the experience? Did it turn out to be a good one for you? Yes. Harvard is a wonderful school. They have a lot of great professors. That's, I think, the thing that sets mm -hmm. them apart from the rest is that they bring in some talented people that are really willing to uh, mentor students and take their time out of their schedule to help you succeed. And so one of the most invaluable experiences I got was that Harvard actually allows you to work with startup businesses. And I had some good uh, professors mentoring me on how I can help these startup companies get off the ground. And so it was really great. So you go into Harvard Law at about 19. Um, just between the two of us, did you ever feel intimidated or in over your head when you got there? So... I have to give a shout out to Rice again. They their bioengineering program uh, beat me up so much. There was really <laughs> there was really nothing that uh, felt intimidating after uh, the all nighters that I had to pull to get through that program. Right. <laughs> so, but I, I will say that it it really it's a really wonderful realization when you realize how great the student body is. Mm -hmm. And so I always felt like if I couldn't handle it, I knew somebody else who could handle it and show me how. And so the, the camaraderie you develop and the alumni network is just wonderful. To your point now, I've always believed that one of the most significant advantages to going to these big Ivy League schools, particularly the mm -hmm. Harvard Law School, is not just the high quality education you get, but the contacts that you make. The people in your classroom at Harvard Law are the people who you know mm -hmm. are going to be running the world. So tell me about those, about those relationships that you've established now at such a young age that you'll be able to call upon for the rest of your life. Yeah, well, I think uh, the big thing about going to those relationships, and I kind of took from our relationship, mm -hmm. which is you always try to bring something to the table. And so for me, you know, making sure that I'm there for people, people will be there for me. And I, I was really... I was really happy to see how down to earth the student body was. I mean, I found some people who were, you know, down home southern just like me, mm -hmm. and uh, we had some cookouts, barbecues, uh, threw down on some gumbo. It was wonderful. <laughs> and so, you know, it's, it's really nice that no matter where you go, people are people. Yeah. You mentioned a, a, a wonderful uh, notion early in this conversation of demystifying these places that just frighten and scare and intimidate mm -hmm. people. Um, and over the years uh, of your being at Harvard Law School, you had some, some young people come to class with you. Yes, and yes. the purpose of that was what? Well, so it's real easy for me to say you can do it too. Mm -hmm. It's a whole other experience when you sit in the classroom and you say, oh, I actually understand what the professor's saying, and 
it was I put them at somewhat of a disadvantage because I had actually brought them in in the middle of the semester just to show you you have you weren't here yesterday you won't be here tomorrow but just today you were able to pick up in the middle of our conversation and get the material and uh, I even had one of my high school mentees he went to class with me and he uh, he had this idea he didn't want to say it, so I'm like okay what's your idea raised my hand, said it, the, the professor said, oh, that's a great point, and he felt uh, real he, good. He was afraid to say it. Yes. But he, he whispered it to you. Yes. And you said it, and the professor said, great question. Yeah, yes. <laughs> and a lot of times, you know, people, they think that they're, they're somehow not getting something or they, they can't be right. And just showing them that, no, you, you got it. You can be here. You can do this. And not only can you do this, but you can do this great. Yeah. You were at Rice and you were at the Harvard Law School not because you're black, but because you are gifted, because you are talented. You happen to be in a black body. Um, but what say you about, about not, again, just this achievement gap, mm -hmm. but about this opportunity gap in America where young black men and young people of color, for that matter, are concerned? Well, I think the, the problem and the answer, we, we see it on this stage, mm -hmm. which is, on other stages, they don't have positive black role models, and here you do. And I think that more people, if they push forward the positive black role model, you will show people what they can do. Um, if all you see when you look on TV looking for people who look like you is, you know, criminals, who's on the, the news today and things like that, that's what you're going to believe is kind of your maximum capability. And so for me, I was very blessed that I got to interact with some uh, young black professionals at an early age and know that, no, this is the options laid out before me. I don't have any other ones but to be like them. And so I think that going forward, we could really positively affect this achievement gap if we really put forward the positive images and not just emphasize the negative. Yeah. And finally, say a quick word about your mama. She's in the corner off camera, so <laughs> the audience cannot see her, but she, she ain't never too far from her baby. Uh, yeah. And uh, I love your mother because she is the one that brought you to see me yes. when you were just 10. And, and we became fast friends when you were just a kid standing in a book line to get one of my books signed. I'll never forget it for as long as I live. But your mother has been awfully supportive of you. Yes. Yeah, truth be told, she's not only been supportive of me, but she's supportive of everybody around us. Yeah. So uh, all of my cousins, any family friends, they always know they can count on her to be uh, there for something positive. Earlier in the week, she was at one of my cousin's track meets just because he had uh, gone to regionals. And for me, she taught me that it's not just about your professional responsibility. So, you know, as a lawyer going forward, as an engineer, uh, as a business owner, I'm going to have some professional responsibilities. But no matter how substantial or how taxing those professional responsibilities are, I'm always going to have the personal responsibility. So I'm always going to have the responsibility to take time out of my schedule, make sure I make my way back to Houston, and uh, make sure I can pick up the phone and talk to some people who they're trying to, you know, either follow in my footsteps or do something bigger, which for me it's always about I want you to be doing something bigger than me. So I, I'm, I'm really enamored, I'm really fascinated about that idea of if I can help you, you can use me as the, the shoulder you stand on and you do something bigger. That's why I love Cornelius. <laughs> That's why I love this kid. Uh, he had a kid. I love this young man. I've known him since he was a kid. Take a look at that face, Jonathan X. I want the audience to look at that face. Uh, you're going to see it again. You're going to hear the name Cortland Wycliffe again. Um, he is 22, now on his way to Texas A&M to get a Ph.D. in mm -hmm. engineering, and um, I'm honored to have had him.